Greetings, everyone. It's Ron Valent. I'm reposting part of an interview I had while running for the PPC in the federal election. The interview was done with Prince George Matters, and Kyle Balzer is the interviewer. And I believe it was Jessica Fedigan who was uh, manning the camera. Uh, I also went in and talked about caribou recovery at UNDRIP as well. Uh, very important issues that we're facing now as we see all the blockades going across Canada. We wonder what's going on. Well, it's all related. So uh, go ahead and check that out. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that uh, the person behind the camera was not quite liking what I was sharing, the red pilling I was doing. And you can hear some foot tapping telling uh, Kyle to move it along. Another big issue is the whole thing with caribou recovery. Have you heard of it? Of course. Mm -hmm. Hey, caribou recovery. I mean, so this is uh, from the federal government. And they, the whole, I, it, there's a, an agreement, right? There's an agreement between the federal government, the BC government, West Moberly and the SOTU Aboriginal bands in uh, having over a million acres of land, and it could be three times that from what people have been telling me, in order to preserve a few thousand uh, caribou, right? That's a huge, vast amount of, all the way down to McBride even, you know? So uh, it's a, and the, the whole premise is that you have to protect the caribou habitat to protect the species, to regrow the species or whatever. And, to, and it actually, within that agreement, it says to uh, bring it up to numbers of, for ancestral Aboriginal harvesting activities. So what does that have to do with preserving caribou? They threw that in there. They're not talking about the, you know, the real issues that kill caribou. Like the guys in Mackenzie were saying, when the caribou cross back and forth over the lake, they've seen 60 drop dead because one will fall in, the ice will break and they'll fall in and they're like sheep, they just keep on falling in and the wolf population is going after the caribou. You got uh, the hunters, I talked to a guy in McKenzie, he says that we're not allowed to hunt grizzly bear, and the grizzly bears are going after the caribou. So, and, and really for the habitat, it makes no sense. If you're gonna go ahead and drill a well, it's not gonna kill a caribou. The caribou will just move away. And the caribou are only in certain small sections. They're not over a whole million acres. So it's just really a land grab is what it is. And, um, it's very interesting that um, in that in that agreement, if I can just pull it up here real quick, um, it says something that's really bizarre. Because I mean, what does this have to do actually with uh, with preserving caribou? And it actually goes into a far uh, greater issue. And I'll just read it to you here real quick. Okay, whereas British Columbia and Canada are committed to fully adopting and implementing the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples and the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Okay, so in UNDRIP, I was given this. This is UNDRIP right here. And I'll tell you something that uh, Article 26, and I'll be finished we'll here. Try to keep this moving along. Yeah, I rock. <laughs> Indigenous peoples have the rights to the lands, territories, and resources for which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used. Okay, so it's very open ended. And anyhow, I made a video on this. It's on my YouTube channel. I recommend everyone go and see it. Go and search Ron Valent, or you can go PPC and then a space and Ron B. It's absolutely critical that everyone watches this video and watch Agenda 21 video. It's time for this section of the debate. Um, the open debate is over, but we continue on our theme of Indigenous Affairs. We have a question from an audience member here in Gatineau, Natasha Beattie. Go ahead, Natasha. Good evening. Uh, as a member of Beausoleil First Nation, uh, my question is this. Uh, if elected, how would your parties work with provinces and territories on recognizing and affirming Indigenous rights? specifically noting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, and the calls for justice in the recent missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Korea. Miigwech. 
<clears throat> the leaders will all have a chance to answer this question. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, starting with Mr. Scheer. When we're talking about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we need to remember that when you talk about free, prior, and informed consent, that leaves a great deal of uncertainty about what that means. And there are large numbers of Indigenous communities who want these energy projects to succeed, and we need certainty and clarity around that. All right, we, are, we will now go to Ms. May. Natasha Megwich. It's an extremely important question, and Greens across the country are united in this. We will honor the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It must be brought into law in this country, and our existing web of laws and regulations, which were properly described by the inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women as constituting structural violence, must be reviewed and brought up to the standard of the United Nations Declaration. We must bring in the recommendations of the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's not a short-term project. It is on us as settler, Canadian, settler Canadians to bring justice. Mr. Bonshaw. Yes, we also support the declaration of the United Nations on the rights of indigenous people. I do believe, and I've spent the most beautiful moments of this campaign with people from the First Nations. They are nations, as well as Canada is a nation and Quebec is a nation. And a nation does not put its, its culture, its language, its heritage in the hands of another nation. So what they ask for, and they have to ask, because we are not, you know, we are no better than they are to represent themselves, is that all those reports and inquiries and declarations bring something real and respectful for them. Mr. Trudeau. Thank you, Natasha, for your question. We have moved forward on reconciliation in ways that no previous government has been able to, but I am the first to recognize there is much more to do. We lifted 87 long-term boil water advisories, and we are on track to lifting the 50 more, uh, but we're continuing to invest in communities. On the issue of child and family services, we recognize uh, the tribunal's ruling that says that children need to be compensated, and we will be compensating them. We also want to move forward with Grassy Narrows it, with the community on a treatment centre and money is not the objection to investing in what they need in that treatment centre. Thank you, Ms. Bernier. No other leader is ready to build a new relationship with our First Nation. They all support the status quo, but the system is broken. We still have extreme poverty on reserve. We need a bold reform and we are the only party that will try to implement property rights on reserve and also establish a new relationship based on self-reliance for these uh, communities. We need to build a new system, working with them, but that's not what they want because we cannot fix the system right now if we don't do a bold reform and we are ready for that. Mr. Singh. Thank you so much for your question. Um, Really, it's, it's a matter of respect and dignity. All, all of the issues that you've raised come down to that basic question of respect and dignity. And one of the first things we would do, we wouldn't take indigenous kids to court and challenge a decision that says they were wil wil willfully and recklessly discriminated against. We wouldn't do that. We would immediately address issues of justice. That means implementing all the recommendations from the reports that are so powerful and have a guideline towards solving the problems. We'd make sure there's clean drinking water. I don't accept any excuses why we can't in 2019. We'd make sure that we implement clean housing, uh, good quality housing, and education and welfare services. We can do these things. Agenda 21 is the action plan. It's the blueprint to inventory and control all land, all water, all plants, all minerals, 
all animals, all construction, all means of production, all information, all energy, all education, and all human beings in the world. In a nutshell, the plan calls for governments to take control of all land use and not leave any of the decision-making in the hands of private property owners. It is assumed that people are not good stewards of their land and the government will do a better job if it is in control. Individual rights in general are to give way to the needs of communities as determined by a globalist governing body. Moreover, people should be rounded up off of the land and packed into human settlements or islands of human habitation, as they are called in the UN Agenda 21 documents, close to employment centers and transportation. Another program, called the Wildlands Project, spells out how most of the land is to be set aside for non-humans. In anticipation of our objections to such plans, our civil rights will be dissolved. What's happening is that there is a massive resource grab going on all over the planet. Today, as money has been sucked dry, the only thing left to do is to make a grab for the resources themselves. And that's what sustainable development is all about, is taking the resources of the world away from you and me, away from private companies that aren't part of the clique, if you will, and putting them into a global common trust that will be managed by them for their benefit. The UN Paris Agreement, most expensive treaty in world history. The Green New Deal estimates up to 94, 93 or four trillion dollars, uh, hammering families with unnecessary energy costs. We have uh, gas tax proposals, 50 cents a gallon. Would you rather have bad storms or pay 50 cents a gallon? I'm sorry. So if we all agree to pay 50 cents a gallon, we're going to get less hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and droughts. What era are we living in? They're essentially saying your SUV controls the weather the same as your car controls it. So it's a way to transform the economy, massive wealth redistribution, massive central planning with literally bean counters affecting every aspect of your life. And I say that because the UN chief has actually said we need to treat meat eaters the same way we treat smokers and relegate them to a section of a restaurant or outside or ban it completely. We need to uh, stop gas powered cars, ban that, make them all electric, despite the fact that electric uses all sorts of rare earth minerals that you need massive amounts of fossil fuels to get and battery technology and they're no more earth friendly. We need to affect our diet, agriculture, they're going after cows, they're going after your appliances, Energy Star, uh, Department of Energy, every aspect of your life, your washing machines, your dishwashers, less efficient, less powerful, more efficient, but less powerful than they were 15 years ago. Low-end appliances 15 years ago outperform high-end ones today because the government is slowly choking the life out of everything and making them less and less powerful, all in the name of saving the planet. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm so glad you're on time. I'm V. I'm looking forward to showing you around Planopolis today. My husband works from home. He's a virtual engineer working on one of the city's desalination plants. He controls the robots who do all the important maintenance. I think he basically plays computer games for a living. <laughs> Are you ready to go? Have you got your calorie card open on your smartphone? I registered your visit with Slick Travel Corp the other day, so they've uh, allotted you a journey time to, to match mine. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? Switch off brain and go to work. <laughs> with this many people around, I'm glad there's a mega computer in charge. We're so lucky. Uh, our kids were allocated a school quite near my practice, so I can drop them off on the way. It saves on our calorie ration. Well, it won't be long until the little darlings get their career announcements. They've been working so hard, so I'm sure they'll get something good. N not that there's anything wrong with fixing carbon scrubbers for a living or anything. Are you hungry? Let's pop to the market as we're passing. Right, what's on the menu this month? No, not meat. It's not your birthday. The Global Food Council are doing a really good job of keeping food production going. I mean, you don't get the choice you used to, but we're better off than most. I think it's probably easiest to walk from here. You barely see a car in the city centre nowadays, unless you're rich. <laughs> oh, the state knows they just aren't practical anymore. We're all trying to meet our global carbon deal. 
electric bikes are so much better for getting around our neighbourhood. And why waste valuable space on car parks when you can use them to grow food? I don't care what you say, Alex. They don't deserve to live in that ghetto. They are completely disconnected. No high-speed transport system, no new internet. They miss out on jobs and many essential services too. Oh, hi again. <laughs> what a day. I had to make a, an emergency visit to the Cry Freedom ghettos. I mean, I miss my sister like mad, but I'm glad they went when they moved to New Amsterdam. They're safe from climate change on the floating city. <laughs> that must be her now. It's much easier to meet up with friends virtually now. So many cities have banned cars in central areas. Ooh, looks like she's got some juicy gossip.